Hi, my name is Connie Arzigian, and I'm an archaeologist with the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. I'm going to talk to you today about Native American pottery that was made in the Upper Midwest during pre-contact era. So we have a variety of different kinds of pottery. When it's a big piece, it's pretty easy to tell. We're going to show you how to identify the different attributes of a potsherd so that you can recognize it in even small pieces. We'll talk about how pottery is made. We'll compare it to different kinds of other materials. And then we'll compare it to different kinds of ceramics. Um, so check the timestamps below for particular segments. First, we're going to talk about how pottery is made and what the different parts of the pottery are. So pottery is made out of clay and a variety of different kinds of tempers. So clay starts off when it's dry, it's very hard. It could be powdered at this stage and then mixed with water and temper. But I've got some that's wet here that uh, when it's wet and it's just pure clay, it's a very sticky material. And clay is actually a very dense material. It does, it's not porous. And if there were any moisture trapped in the clay, it would stay there. And this would mean that the pot would fracture when it was drying or when it was being fired. So what temper does is it creates a more porous surface so that the moisture can escape and the pot won't fracture. So what I'm doing is I'm mixing some sand in with my clay. Sand is one of the more common tempers that people were using in the past. And this will help to make the pottery both easier to work with and it'll keep it from fracturing. So when people were making this pottery, they were forming it by hand. There was no wheel in Native America, in North America and they were open air firing it. So they would fire this in an open air fire and rather than in a kiln, and the temperature would get up potentially to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are pretty hot fires and they would have made very good cooking pots and water storage vessels and so forth. So you can see with my piece of pottery, now that I've mixed it with a temper, it's got some sand in it, it's easy enough for me to work. Uh, my fingers aren't all sticky anymore, so I've got a piece of clay that I can work now. I can roll it into a coil. I could start weaving all of these into a pot. I'm not going to do that at this stage, but I want to talk about the different kinds of tempers that we have here. So we've got sand that we just used, and that's very commonly used, but there's also pieces of crushed rock. We could have a piece of something like a granite or another igneous rock that has a lot of crystalline material in it and it's starting to decompose and you can crush that up, you can break that up and you can come up with smaller pieces of fine granular material that you can use as a temper. And we'll see that in some of our specimens also. We could also be taking shell, burn it, and then it becomes very crumbly and you can crush this up too into a very fine structure. So the shell and the crushed rock have a very, they're small spheres, but the sh shell is very platy. It has a very distinctive platy structure to it that will give a kind of a laminar structure to the pottery. And that allows the pots to be made both big and relatively thin walled. So this pot is made of uh, shell and it's a, it's a good sized pot and it's got a pretty thin wall for it. So shell is a very good structural material. This pot probably dates to about 1500 AD. This pot here is a little bit older. This has a sand and crushed rock, or we call it grit temper, and the sherds are a little bit thicker, but it's still a very well-made vessel. And this one dates probably to about three or 400 AD. So the temper is essential for allowing the pot to be fired. And it also tells us when we can see how people are doing different kinds of tempers, we can figure out what time period they are and how uh, people were using this material to make vessels. Let's say you find something that you think might be pottery. Here's some things to take a look at. First, look to see if it has two relatively parallel sides. It would be the inside and the outside of the vessel. And does it have a slight curvature to it? 
It doesn't have to have a curvature, but quite often pottery will if it's coming from a relatively small vessel. So you have something that's relatively thin and flat with two parallel surfaces. You want to start looking at the cross section. You want to look to see in a fresh break somewhere or in a, in a spot that's been open if you can see what the structure is of the material. And you might have to break off a piece of it. If you can't break it, it's a stone. Pottery usually breaks pretty easily. So pottery is going to have a mixture of the clay and the temper. And in a pot shirt, in a cross section, or even on the surface, you're going to be able to see that combination, that variation between particles of sand or crushed rock or some other temper and the paste. In a piece of natural material, um, like sandstone, you'll see the individual sand grains, and they might kind of look like they're in layers. This says actually has two parallel flat surfaces, but the material, when you zoom in on it, is going to be all uniform sand grains. And likewise with this material, although it kind of looks like um, on one surface that it might be from pottery, the texture is all uniform. It doesn't have that variation between the clay and the temper that we would expect with pottery. Some kinds of stones actually break in thin flat pieces like various different types of feldspars um, and those can be confusing but again you look at them they're going to be a uniform texture and they might be crystalline surfaces that will make it very clear that they are crystal stone rather than pieces of pottery. The temper in the pottery is very helpful for archaeologists to, to date it. So this particular piece of pottery is about 2,000 years old it's very thick, which is another indication that it's pretty old, but it also has very coarse crushed rock in it. So this is a good example of that variation between clay and the crushed rock temper on it. Other shirts might have finer temper, but there's still going to be that crushed rock and they'll still have that variation in them, particularly in the cross section. We get back to about 1000 AD to uh, up to contact, people are using shell for the temper, and you can see here some flecks of shell, and you can see some places where the shell actually leached out, leaving holes. But it leaves a very distinctive platy texture to the cross section. So even if the shell is not there in certain places, you can tell that it used to be there. And it's a very distinctive texture that is recognizable, and it's different from the kind of massive texture that we would find with crushed rock and grit. There are other kinds of stones that are kind of tricky and might fool you. This is a, an example of something that seems to have all the characteristics of pottery. It's got a curve, it's got parallel surfaces, but it's a stone. If you look at this cross section, it's part of a nodule that was forming around some spherical object. And it's very hard, it's not gonna be breakable. And again, in cross section, it's very clear that this material is stone. Other kinds of material, um, you might find different textures of those holes. Um, these are square holes that would be coming from something that was limestone tempered. So rather than having the platy texture of a shell, it would be kind of square texture. So this doesn't actually have limestone in it anymore, it just has the clay, but it has the holes from the limestone. And then other materials that might be confusing, this is a sandstone iron concretion um, that when you look at it again will have just solid material, but it's kind of a weird shape. And some of these other materials are just odd shapes. So if it's got uniform textures of material, um, this one has a lot of fossil fragments in it, but it doesn't have that fine matrix um, that we expect with the pottery. Native American pottery, as we said, will show a mixture of either crushed sand or rock or shell. Historic pottery will also have that same material, but it'll be in a much finer texture and the surfaces will usually have some sort of a glaze or a finish on them. This piece is from the top of a clay flower pot and it's the closest equivalent to a kind of a low fired earthenware pot and you can readily see the cross section is going to have a very fine temper uh, but it still has that same mixture 
of clay and temper. We can recognize this as being historic because of the very fine polished texture and it is higher fired. It will sound a little bit um, higher ringing when you tap it with your fingernail. Other kinds of earthenware pottery will again show that cross section with the temper and the paste, but it will be finer. The temper is in this case often crushed other pieces of pottery called crushed grog or ash or other material mixed in as a temper. The surface will quite often have at least someplace remnants of a slip or a glaze. Uh, so low, even low fired ceramics will still have that kind of material to them. Higher fired cream wares and white wares will have a much finer texture, but if you look really closely, you'll still be able to see some of that differentiation. And it'll look different from the individual sand grains that we were seeing with a piece of sandstone or, or uh, the uniform texture from a rock. If you have most of a surface that's been eroded, if you didn't have this nice finished edge on here, you would still be able to recognize this as historic ceramics because of the hardness of it and the texture that has a kind of a mixture of fine clay and very fine temper in it. This piece is, is weird. It's a piece of linoleum from our lab and it has the same mixture of temper and fine material in it, but it's got a very distinctive very flat surface, it's a floor tile, and it's got very distinctive surface polish on it too. Bricks are another material that might be confused with pre-contact ceramics, um, but bricks will tend to be much more porous, they'll obviously be much thicker and even smaller pieces will tend to have a very irregular surface unless they're coming from a whole brick like these. Uh, the temper is still in there. There is a mixture of material, but it could be very variable. And you can see in each of these pieces that there's large pieces of different kinds of tempers that are mixed in with the clay. That's going to vary almost from every single manufacturer. This one has the word woodland engraved on it, uh, which is kind of interesting. But these are related to historic ceramics, but they're very different kind and they're usually recognizable because of their much thicker texture. Uh, they will tend to be lighter and more porous than other kinds of ceramics. So now you know about clay, about different kinds of tempers the Native Americans used in their pottery and how to recognize it in a pot shirt. So if you find something on the ground, you can look to see if it's got that variation between the temper and the crushed rock or the sand or the shell, and you can distinguish it from pieces of stone or different kinds of more recent historic ceramics. What do you do if you find something? Then check the description box for links to information about how to report your sites, how to keep track of the information about them, and links to all of the state archaeologists so that you can contact somebody and tell them about your site. Thank you for watching.